Welcome back to the CIO Lifeline. I'm your host, Tony Darden. With me is Craig Schroeder. Today, we're going to talk about talent management, the intricacies that come with managing your staff, how the atmosphere has changed since COVID, expectations of younger talent, managing older gen, the blending of the two, and various other points around this topic. Stick around. Craig, how are we doing today? Great. How about you, Tony? I'm well. You know, we were kicking around what topics to cover when we came across talent management. I, I feel like we had two light bulbs go off because it's something that has been tough managing for us. Mm-hmm. I, would, I think that's a fair statement as far as not only finding the right people, but finding the work ethic, um, the different dynamics that go into that fit. Because it's not just about you know the skill set and and that that knowledge they bring, but there's also that I'll call it the X factor and, and personality and culture fit. Am I striking the right chords with this? Oh yeah, yeah. That's uh, you know, and and it's their strengths and what they, I guess, how they're wired. And, you know, how they like to work, you know, is just really managing all those components. So you're just getting the most out of them. Well, and you try and get your arms around that from the beginning, right? So you think of the interview process. So what are the core questions you have to ask, right? What's your religion? How much do you weigh your sexual orientation, your juvenile arrest record? Sir, get down! Get down! Get down! Clearly, I'm joking, but there's a point here, right? Make sure you tie off on HR and legal because it's not just what you should be asking, it's what you can't ask. All right, so let's, let's, uh, let's continue on a serious note. If you were to rewind the clock before COVID versus today, do you find it, because I don't want to overgeneralize this, but do you find that it has been a greater struggle? And, and what are some of the reasons you think are behind it all? It is... A bigger struggle for sure. I think people just had things reset in their mind for life work balance. And they looked, they were home more and they, for the first time in a long time, they had a break to really think about life versus the majority of their hours alive or work, right? Or during the day or work. I found, um, personally in, in filling select roles in our organization, it's been a lot of no shows, ghosting, job hopping, and and I just struggle with is this a generational thing? I don't want to be unfair to to younger talent because that's where we that's where it was most prevalent. But uh, I would say all ages and and other factors, genders that it's been more uh, prevalent. The ghosting was a big surprise to me. Just the no shows and just not showing up. I, I, I think people just got out of balance. You know, they just swung too far to the personal side instead of the work balance. And then I think that now it's catching up of, hey, I got to got to work too. There's this rewinding that is happening right now. And, and you mentioned the last episode we did together about the, the 16 different personalities. How, how important is knowing how this individual is wired? I, I think it's extremely important. I mean, I use that as a pre-screening tools when I'm recruiting for uh, clients. Um, it tells you what kind of person they are. But then the thing I look for is what kind of feedback do they give me about the assessment? Do they think it's spot on? Do they self-reflect and do they agree with it? Because it's those those kind of responses after they take that assessment specifically, you know, of you get some dialogue. You could say a comment to me, I could say a comment to you, and we could just take, it could totally be different. Um, to another person, they could get offended just because of how they're naturally wired. I like when you said the uh, communication, how you say something might be received differently depending on the person. Like I always, I, I love, I love using this little exercise. You know, I, I always say, um, it starts with a sentence. I didn't say Mark robbed PNC bank. Take that sentence and put emphasis on each word. So you have seven words. And if you emphasize each one differently, it captures a different meaning, right? I didn't say Mark robbed PNC bank. That was you, Craig. You robbed the bank, right? I didn't say Mark robbed P. 
PMC Bank. Starts with an assumption that someone said, I did say it. You, you see what I mean? And obviously, I didn't say Mark robbed PNC Bank. So it is all about um, communication and, and how individuals receive that communication, which is one of the downsides, I think, with email and texting. Uh, you know, you have the caps, right? But but it's so easy to to misinterpret the meaning. All the time. Texting is just terrible for it. The misinterpretation of texting, right? That That's a big, big thing. And even email. But again, really having those conversations. And, you know, I used to do the five minute daily standups with my team in the morning just to say, hey, this is what we got going on. What did I need to know from yesterday? And then you don't, you can kind of minimize a lot of that. For those standups, do you uh, require the camera on or is it just audio or, or a mix of both? Before COVID, it was just phone in, just make sure you're there. Now I, I, I like uh, video on all the time. I agree. I, I like, I mean, you, you can see the, there's nonverbal cues and just things that you're just more engaged, right? And you're, you're less likely to stray and do something else. And Teams and Zoom makes it easy to multitask in a bad way. So, so back to like the email and texting, are there those generational considerations we should be mindful of and supportive of, or are we, are we coming in prescriptive um, for everybody? I think there's guidelines, right? I mean, there is generational things for sure. You know, I have an email etiquette document and meeting etiquette document that I hand out. I created a long time ago, just saying, okay, don't reply all. Thank you. Let's assume we're thankful people. And then, you know, just cut down email noise, but really, you know, chat for day to day um, talking because you can ask for clarification really fast, email for longer dialogue, you know, and especially external and text for like emergency only kind of stuff, you know? So, but I think you got to work across all the platforms now because of the generations. And then with the advent of hybrid work, are you looking for those that, that want to be back in the office? Is that a factor that, that employers should consider? Um, or are we just purely focused on on the skill set, regardless of, you know, proximity to our four walls. I do see people wanting to come back to work, but they want the hybrid. Like you said, it's here. I think the key is just get the communication standards of how you're going to communicate, who you are, and make sure that it's consistent. You know, the standups maybe once or twice a week, if not every day, if you need one. When I ran Agile Dev Group, um, we had standups every morning. So we were only 24 hours from going way off track. You go heads down on something and you can go off track really fast. Sure. Um, Especially in a development uh, landscape. Oh. Yeah. While we do want some standards and expectations, giving that flexibility and being malleable, if I'm saying it right, to to suggestions. and Because every team probably has a different, not probably, every team has a different personality mix, culture fit, and what may work and be successful for one group might be a detriment to the other. So figuring that out collaboratively, I think always bears the most fruit. Yeah. And, and, and empowering them, you know, pushing responsible decision-making down to the lowest level is super cool. I like and it. It, it gets them really engaged because yeah. you're saying, you know, cause there's a lot to learn through mistakes. If you're making 10% mistakes, that's cool. You, as long as you're not making them over and over again, that's what we don't want. So retrospectives on when you do make a mistake, don't beat them up. Say, okay, what'd you learn and how are we not going to do that again? And then that's coaching, it's mentoring, it's letting them grow and it's freeing you up because you're pushing things down. You have to fail. I, I don't think you become a great leader until you've had a, um, um, a series of failures. Otherwise, everybody gets a medal. You know, there's, there's that. That, and that's also part of, you know, back to the generational differences. I tell everybody, if you're not failing, you're not, you're not growing. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, I think John Maxwell said fail forward or something like that. Now you got AI, sprinkle AI into that. And it's like, okay, we got to try stuff. Let's just not drive off a cliff or do fatal mistakes. I love humility in, in a leader, empathy. I like that collaboration and and owning failures and, and learning from those 
creating teachable moments. I mean, we're all in it together. Nobody's perfect. I don't know if you read Patrick Lencioni's book, uh, the, oh, ideal team player. Mm, I have not. Yeah. It's great. The three, three items to review people are, are humble, hungry, and smart. Do they say, I'm sorry? That's the humble, right? And you want them hungry. You want, well, you want them making mistakes. So the key is to put the retrospectives in place. So they evaluate the mistakes, tell you how they're not going to do it again and what they learn. And then you, you want some level of intelligence or them to be growing and they want to be self-growing, you know, so really look for those key things and have a growth track for them. You know, what's, what, what should they be learning that's best for the company and for them? Sometimes it gets, this is what I want to do. And I'm like, well, is that best for the company? You know, so really get them thinking business and whatever skill set they have to offer. Now, if you're a smaller organization where you don't have a bunch of tiered positions or you just find that it's long tenured where you might be, at least on paper, in a particular position for a lot longer than than you may have aspired to. But how do you so so how do you manage that? And also expectations where individual comes in at a junior level and then you know two years later expecting to be senior. <laughs> you know. Really having that career map set up from the from the beginning, if you can. I mean even small com- small companies you just you're they're even more agile, right? What do we need to learn for the next 90 days, six months. But maybe if it's a bigger organization, you have like a two year roadmap for this person to get power platform certified or some test or watch some Udemy classes online, just some training track. You know, you know, you don't want clock watchers, right? That, I mean, I think the hybrid post COVID world, that doesn't factor in so much, but the traditional nine to fiver, I think is, uh, I mean, it's still there, but not as not as important as it may have been years ago. And it's not, and boy, you have, we all have to adjust our attitude on that one because it's, it's about productivity management versus time management. You want to keep them engaged and motivated, you know? So just really, if just watch the projects, as long as you can have some kind of measurable. You can manage time frames like nine to five. Now, if you're a small team and there's only your team of one, that's a different conversation. But, but if you have a customer service group, and your core hours are eight to eight, you can figure it out. There's going to be times, again, new world, right? That But this person has a doctor's appointment or it's a sunny day in a week that's supposed to be drenching rain and they want to take an opportunity to cut the grass. I mean, I mean, pick your, pick your spot. I feel like flexibility in us getting used to that as leaders is very important. That working genius assessment is perfect for that because it tells you, who's going to burn out over time. It just gives you that insight or who's going to be in their sweet spot jamming and just working and and taking care of business. If you stay on those assessments, you really can minimize turnover and allow flexibility. Yep. Work-life balance. I'm hearing that and what you're saying, right? Work, there should be a work-life balance built into this. Another thing I heard you say that I liked, I always did with my developers is you always have a, I'm going to call it a pet project, but, uh, it's still project worth getting done. It just may not be in the top five of things to do, but you need that distraction. I mean, and I was a developer for almost 20 years of my career, and I knew that if there was something that I just could not break through, having a diversion, working on something else tend to free the mind against what I was constrained with in the other project. And it, it's a change of pace. It's a project that I have a really strong interest in, not that the work you do in general isn't interesting. <laughs> this is your career after all, but, but I think you see the point. Oh yeah. When I, when I had that team of developers, sometimes we just have to go for a walk in the park because you hit a wall and when you're out and you're not just hard thinking, hard pushing your mind, your mind can access different parts of your brain when you're not, when you're just like exercising or walking or something like that. It's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. I did that a lot. We were talking about what, what we're looking for in, in your assessments on onboarding, but I do even something as simple as the happy hour test because I'm, I'm big on that culture, personality fit. So getting them outside of that structured interview into a social setting and, if, and having other team members uh, join in if we can, but just get us to get a sense of the individual when the guard is let down. Do we see a fit there? Because a lot of times, um, at least 
in, in my experience, I could have the person who strikes all the chords from a, from a technical side, fits the job description perfectly, but there was going to clearly be a culture clash, if you will. Um, I'm probably looking at options two and three if they exist. I, I love the happy hour test. And I also like the spousal test, taking, taking them out to dinner with the spouses uh, just to see how they treat each other because crazy at home is going to be crazy at work. Ah, oh man, this is a gem. Yeah. I do. I, I love that. Yeah. I had that miss many times, man. I, I started doing that quite a bit and it's just like, wow, it's uh, that, that, that I, I passes all like the that. HR rules, right? Cause oh, it, yeah. you're, just going out, you're just going out to dinner, you know, because <laughs> when you, you, when you said the sentence, I, something inside me twitched a little bit. I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, but <laughs> you're just going out to dinner, have yeah. a glass of wine. That's all general, yeah. general conversation, get to know each other. What about assessing how this person will be under fire, the crunching crisis, something's gone down, a key system's in place. Are they going to focus? Or are they going to fold? It's one of the two. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I, you know, I usually talk to them about hobbies outside of work, what they do for fun. And sometimes that, that'll give you some indicators like, do they like hiking? Do they like, you know, are they active? Because, you know, that's not a perfect path either, you know, and sometimes that could clue you in. I mean, I've given the boilerplate questions during an interview, you know, if if depending on the role they're in, I, I, I think of a crisis moment that we've had as an organization and ask what their approach will be. And, you know, are they, do they have to look up to the left and, and think hard or do they reflexively go into crisis management mode? I mean, these are the, the different indicators I'm looking for. And sometimes to say, I don't know, I don't mind that answer because they're not trying to make something up in the moment. That, that's where the, the benefit is. But, but anytime they can try and paint a, um, a picture of uh, calm and getting the right people in the room and, you know, you, you think of your internal checklist so I want to understand, I want to assess how good is this individual at reading the room? I always like to go back to, uh, I always say, if Peter Gibbons from Office Space can do it, then anybody can. Uh, so I go through these thousands of lines of code and uh, it doesn't really matter. I, uh, I don't like my job and uh, I don't think I'm going to go anymore. When you see someone's attention drift, do they, are they able to pick up on that? Because especially when you get the C-suite as, as a captive audience, being able to pick up as, you know, when they start checking their phone for text or looking off into the, out the window, I mean, you need to be able to pick up on that and pivot as needed. You got to be able to read the room because that, that rapport is key to keeping projects moving and keeping them on task and trust. And sometimes you got to call people out. This is a no phone meeting. We want to, we, we don't want it to go long. We start on time, end on time. And here's the, here's the rules of this meeting. You one, one conversation, one meeting, but the person who's leading it has to be aware and know how to manage that. Cause sometimes that could be scary, you know, to call people out, especially if they're above you. Right. There, I mean, there's expectations on both sides, right? It's not just the person running the meetings set of rules, even though, I mean, that's important. And I love what you're saying, es establishing the etiquette, but then I, as a, as a participant should expect you know, succinct and, and, and some level of, of engagement, you know, if we're here to, to talk about project a, I don't want to drift into side projects F and G, you know what I mean? So I, I feel like there's a little, if one thing that, that it folks have, um, a bad rap on and, and, you know, it's probably still around is being too techie, you know, back to reading the room. If you don't know your audience talking over someone, it's still uncomfortable for me to watch someone do that. You know, you just want to intervene and, 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 uh, try and course correct. But sometimes you, you, you know, those become teachable moments, I think. Right. Definitely teachable moments. And, and if you, if you coach them on in the form of a question, you know, they, certainly they can't come out and say, Hey, no, no electronics, no, this it's, Hey, I'm going to ask that I respect your time, respect my time. I really want to get this, this meeting out on time. And, this is what we want to cover. And if we could just all stay engaged and uh, not get distracted with anything, that'd be great. Cause if we get done early, great, you know, in, in the form of a question is always the best way to have some of those initial conversations while you're coaching people up. It's not as authoritarian if, right. You know, when you, you know, 
blah, blah, blah. What do you think? Definitely lowers the, you know, the, another thing I always think of when, um, with talent and, and, and helping to train people up is when new hires enter the organization. This is another one that I, it's easy to kind of lose your patience with, but it's so important to, to recognize and, 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 and get through it, I'll say. And that's anytime you get a new individual in, in a key leadership role in the organization, sometimes I'm not going to use a broad brush here. Sometimes, um, the attitude is well, I'm here to fix you. That's why they brought me in or I'm here to fix the company. Or you might have a hundred reports and, and processes that are used to manage the business and they want to bring in to the organization the 20 things that worked well for that person in their prior career. You know, so as IT folks, you just get a flood of requests. So how you manage those requests and don't reflexively go to, uh, you know, here we go, you know, the new person with, with their grandiose ideas. Depending on the level of that person, you know, it's good to, you know, have like a, a side mentoring going on or where they can ask questions about culture, do's and don'ts about people above them or below them. You know, I've seen that work well called the buddy system or whatever. Well, if you need anything, just go to this person just to, to streamline the onboarding process so they don't have to That's tiptoe. That's fantastic. So of all the companies you worked with, how many have that mentor, mentee, or buddy system approach to individuals in the organization or, or not, new hires? Not enough, right? I mean, we, I saw it successful at a couple of companies and it's, it's just really cool. It brings down the tension so much because they say, oh, I don't know. I'm not going to HR all the time. I can ask the dumb questions to my buddy that's assigned just to help me out, you know? And I think- Bringing that out back is good. And then, you know, the reverse mentoring, like I think we talked about last time was the, maybe the older person that doesn't have the tech, young person has the tech, they mentor tech and they mentor experience. You know, I, I think it just, it just helps them both. And there, then there's this mutual respect and not this hierarchy kind of thing. And, and I love creating exposure to different personalities and skill sets in the organization as a person coming in, as a new person coming in the org organization, there's a lot of value there. Because again, it's not just, you're, you're coming in because the, the company felt you had the right skill set and talent to be um, effective in the group. The soft side, no one can prepare you for. I mean, every company is a little bit different. And being able to ask those hard cultural questions to somebody that you feel like you're not going to get exposed to is... It, it is pretty refreshing to that person. Yeah. Cause if, if, if Craig Schroeder is a huge, asshole, I want to know that up front. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Tony's an, ass, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he just, he talks to you like one and right. you know, you he's your best you buddy. Yeah. Till you turn around. Yeah. 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 Yep. You're in the people business of those that do it, right. A mentor of mine always said that and it never rings truer, especially as your department grows. There's a lot of dynamics, a lot of personalities, and you want to try and stay as close to that as you can because you're only as successful as the people you surround yourself with. All right. So Craig, lots of points we covered today. If you were to, to craft, I'll call it a top three around talent management that organizations and leaders should be aware of? What would you say those are? The buddy system, bringing that back to life would be really good. I think that tears down a lot of walls and insecurities. Um, the reverse mentoring, mentoring up, mentoring down, whether it's tech and experience, youth and age, different skill sets, something around there. Um, and then the self uh, awareness from the assessments, having them take the working genius, the Myers-Briggs, the 16 personalities or DISC. And then, uh, sharing that amongst the team or their peer group and challenging them of how can they interact and communicate better knowing each other's wiring, the natural wiring and strengths. And I think on that last one, does the individual understand it or is it just uh, another Myers-Briggs? Okay, fine. I'm passive aggressive. Can we move on now? You know, you, you want genuine self-awareness on some level. Cause like we said earlier, right? Great leaders have to have failures. I mean, it speaks to that humility and, and learning from past mistakes. 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that after they after they do the assessment, what are their takeaways and what can they put into action personally and professionally? Yep. And then if I were to add a couple for pre-employment, I think that ha- I'll call it the happy hour approach or in, in having inviting, bring your spouses to dinner uh, and just observing and having some of that downtime, I think will will go a long way in assessing that individual for for that culture fit that's very important for your organization. Yeah. The, the spouse to dinner is a big one for me because it, you can just see how they interact. Do they support you know, I mean, it just, it's super important to, to see that because it won't get better, you know, once they come into the organization. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. Hey, if we just have one more kid, this will fix the marriage. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's, we got to be mindful. Yeah. So let's talk about the not so pleasant side of talent management. And that is having to let an individual go or an employee that's been key to your department or organization has decided to leave. Both are hard conversations. And as a leader, I hope you never get comfortable with that to say, oh, I have to let people go all the time, or this happens to me all the time. Never lose your empathy. Remember, especially if you have to let an employee go, whether you think they deserve it or not, you are changing someone's life. They have a family they have to go back to and share the news. There's going to be a transition period. Exit interview. I don't hear about this enough. I always hear, you know, skepticism and lightheartedness around the exit interview. It usually starts with, well, of course that person said, you know, A, B, and C about this person or or the their their boss because they're bitter. You know, they had an ax to grind. To me, an exit interview should be required. And for those that are leaving an organization or have been asked to participate in an exit interview, take it seriously. Not only are you being honest to yourself, you're also helping the organization that you're leaving. And for employers, just because you're hearing something critical doesn't mean a bridge is being burned. Surely, if there is a complaint that they're waging, chances are Past employees may have something similar. Maybe it's time to hold up a mirror about how that department is run and never stop listening. Remember, two ears, one mouth. Use them appropriately. All right, Craig, great conversation as always. Look forward to our next episode where we have Linda Hart from Prince and Isant. We're going to talk about reporting strategies. Think about different systems that are out there today and just the volume of information that gets collected in this ever more automated world. Industry 4.0 is now starting to tip a hat to Industry 5.0 with AI elements. So that data collection and dissemination is growing even faster. So with all these collective sources, what do you do with that data? What's the right approach? Until next time, thanks again. I didn't say Rob, sorry, let me start over. I didn't say Pete robbed, I'm going to start over. <laughs> I didn't say Mark robbed PNC Bank. Um, I lost your audio. Your browser is preventing recording. Ask Craig to refresh the page. Interesting. Never seen that before. Crazy at home will be crazy at work. Crazy at home will be crazy at work. Write that down.